analysis. So there's this kind of worrying um, uh, uh, s s sort of uh, intellectual asset stripping of significant concepts in the psychoanalytical world. Again, I would say that's part of the death instinct. On the other hand, there are really good things being written about by people in the psychoanalytical world, many of whom are in the academic world, and they, they were it not for the academic world's interest in psychoanalysis and the academic writings, we would really be in bad shape. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I think that people in departments of literature or philosophy and so on and so forth are vital to our survival. And I hope if enough people challenge the, um, the uh, if we could develop a psychoanalysis of the psychoanalytical movement, if we could become psychoanalytical about the movement itself and analyze destructive processes inside individual societies, inside uh, regions, inside the IPA, so on and so forth, then I think there would be hope for the future. But people, understandably, get very frightened about being isolated and being uh, put in a position where they're afraid they're never going to get referrals. And it's the, you know, this is, uh, can be very worrying for people, and I, I think that has to be taken very seriously. Absolutely, I mean, and I think what I found, one of the aspects of your novellas that I found so interesting is that they not only have their stories and the developments of their characters, mm -hmm. but uh, my reading of them at least suggested that these were all very, very, firm critiques of institutional psychoanalysis. I mean, you make some very cutting remarks about depression in psychoanalysts, mm -hmm. madness in psychoanalysts. Mm -hmm. and I think it must be in Dark at the End of the Tunnel, the first of your novellas. I think you've got a lovely line halfway through where the analyst is, is having a reflective moment and he says, gosh, you know, looking back on my life, isn't it awful? I've only become a psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been, I, I, I mean, one of the one of the, the, the licenses of fiction is that you can say things that are somewhat outrageous. You can overstate things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like very much what I already said about it being allegoric in many ways. It is allegoric at times. Um, I wouldn't myself want to be affiliated with all the things the psychoanalyst says in these novellas. In fact, the part of him that I like and quite like is the not me part of him. Yes. Um, it's the me part of him that I find to be tedious. But the, the, the not me part is really quite, I, I quite like him in some ways. Um, I, I it, 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 in some ways though, I take your point that it is a way of trying to critique the movement of psychoanalysis within a literary form, which um, I hope will not be uh, too persecuting. In other words, if you engage in self mockery uh, then you can actually challenge other people. You can challenge them. Um, but I, I, I do think there, that um, there are a lot of things in the world of psychoanalysis, institutionalized psychoanalysis, that we as psychoanalysts um, knowingly, not unconsciously, knowingly cover up. We knowingly uh, do not want to, to know. It's not, it would, it, it would not be difficult. In fact, the Tavistock did this in the 1970s. When the Tavistock was in difficulty, they had the sense, Robert Gosling had the sense to call for a study of the institution by a group called BIOS, which was at Brunel University. It's gone now, it doesn't exist anymore. But the, they studied institutions. They, they interviewed every single person who worked at the Tavistock including um, the caterers, you know, everybody. And they then wrote up a report, which really was extremely critical of the management structure and so on and so forth. I wish it had been published for all of us to read. Wasn't, but at least they did it. Um, I've often thought that the British Psychological Society, as indeed many of them, really just need an external audit of truly independent people to go on in and then investigate it, and write up a white paper, which everyone should read. Have you suggested this to your I have. You have. I've suggested it, yep. I, I've suggested it on numerous occasions. I think an examination of the structure of ethics committees, 
which aren't viable in any psychoanalytical society anywhere in the world because psychoanalytical societies are much too small to have a viable ethics committee. But it wouldn't be, take much to create a regional ethics committee that would, be, that would sit for 10 or 12 institutions. And if you had, let's say, seven people on that, three of them could be analysts and the remaining four would be outside the profession, lawyer, doctor, and elsewhere. If you really want to have an independent judicial process to uh, deal with psychoanalytical ethics. Is that a, 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 a wild, bizarre idea? No, it's make, it makes sense. If you really want to change things, you can. But I don't think that these things are really the object of change. They don't want to change them. Mm -hmm. Because I think that these are cozy institutions that live through very complex tribal relations between members of different clans. And uh, do they want to have an independent uh, uh, assessment of themselves, absolutely not. They'll do anything to avoid it. And do they really want to change their structures in more creative ways? I'm afraid I don't think so. So, uh, but look, uh, probably this is true of the, the majority of uh, institutions around the world. I mean, I, I don't think we should be unfair on psychoanalysis and pick on it as some, some odd, you know, odd structure. It's the way the world is. Uh, it's just that it's a little bit annoying if you are a psychoanalyst and this is your world and you see it going on right in front of you. Uh, you one would like to see a wee bit more protest. And I, and I wish there, were more, there was more protest within our psychoanalytical world in writing about things we, that we we've don't We've lost know. the radical tradition that psychoanalysis had historically. Yes. If you think of people like uh, Shandor Ferenczi, uh, Georg Grodek, mm -hmm. some of the Otto Fenichel and, and so forth. Siegfried Bernfeld. Bernfeld yeah. and his yeah. contributions. Yeah. And I, 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 at least I'm not aware of that kind of ferment in the sort of classical British psychological tradition. Yes, I, I wouldn't, I don't, I'm not aware of it either. I mean, Isabel Mengi's Life wrote a very good book on <coughs> institutions and um, the, the, the persecutory processes within the institutions. And um, I certainly think she would have been on board for an examination of the stru of structures. In fact, I, I, I believe she did some sort of study of the, of the British society uh, during the 70s when it was, there was a period of uh, some kind of self-scrutiny. Um, um, and I know that there have been proposals that members of the IGA come to the British society to conduct um, a group an analytical study. And indeed, the independent group did ask uh, a, a, an IGA psychoanalyst to um, convene meetings over several days of the independents in the 1980s. And it was a highly successful meeting mm. and a very good paradigm for how mm. to go forward. Uh, but that tradition did, was not sustained, even though I thought it was very, very encouraging. But what you need, really, in a way, is gifted leadership. You just need someone to, to come in and say, wait a minute, there's something wrong here, and it needs to be changed. But isn't there a difference between intellectual leadership in a field mm. and then a sort of more practical administrative leadership, which might have to include such questions as health and safety and you know, who types up the registration certificates and you know, yeah. who's going to fire the custodian if he's been yeah. caught drinking? and all of that, and then they seem to me very different sorts of challenges. Yeah. And I wonder if there are <coughs> many of the people who, are, who, who might be quite good leaders to take psychoanalysis mm. into a very creative direction, uh, divest themselves of that leadership potential in an institutional context. Yes, I, I mean, would you be a good, a good institutional leader for psychoanalysis? I don't know. You're, you're clearly an intellectual leader. Mm -hmm. I don't know the, uh, the answer to that question. I mean, I was director of training at at the Austin Riggs Center, and I quite liked it. Um, and I, I mean, it may sound odd, but I just love being on a committee. I've always loved committees. Uh, I like the informality of the committee. I like the fact that there's a task. Um, I enjoy thinking about things that I don't ordinarily think about. So I'm all for committee life. Um, and um, I think if an institution is doing its job, then it's a lot of fun to be part of one. Austin Riggs, where I 
worked for several years in the middle 1980s was um, was just a very good place to be. Uh, very, they, they had tasks, they had committees. We all did different things. We worked well together, and I I loved it. I thought it was terrific. Um, and you know, the University of Buffalo's department was very good. I was a professor of English at the University of Massachusetts in the 80s, and that was also a lot of fun. Uh, but I think I, I think that. Um, a good leader comes along if he, if he or she has significant power or is authorized mm. by a group. Comes along and points out the obvious. Like, let me give you an obvious. Mm. Both the American Psychoanalytical Association and the International Psychoanalytical Association have independent ethics committees. So there, they sit to hear issues brought to them of an ethical kind. Each of these committees, however, submits its findings to the executive committee mm. of these organizations for approval. Mm. This is like the Supreme Court in the United States going to George Bush mm. and saying, do you approve of, of, of our decisions? Mm. There is a direct collision between the judicial and the executive branches of these very powerful organizations. Now, do, am I the only one who's ever seen this? Am I the only one who's ever said, you know, there's something slightly wrong about this? That a, an independent judicial inquiry can be compromised by an executive committee reversal? I don't think so. But it goes on anyway. Uh, I'm not in a position of any significance within the IPA or the American Psychoanalytic. It would take somebody within who says, this is not right. Uh, and that's uh, that's what good leaders are 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 there for when when you, when they show up. And it's sad, isn't it, that there aren't very many of them. I mean, if you look at the the presidents of the of the United States, there have been very few really good leaders. Mm -hmm. There have been a lot of really bad leaders. And uh, I think it's a uh, it's an interesting aspect of of. of human choice, isn't it, a collective choice, that we, we let this happen without... But if we think of your very, very significant contributions to the study of characterology yeah. and what it means to be a character, even to be a maverick character, is, is there a cost, is there almost a bloodshed or a danger of being a character? Because if you are very much yourself and you develop your own sense of character, will you automatically be outside what might be some of the less thought through aspects of an institution. Wouldn't that, in order to be that kind of character, wouldn't you have to automatically not want to become a leader in an institutional setting? And that um, might be naive, but, but I, it's something I wonder about that's often. That's a good question. Uh, I'm actually personally rather conventional. I mean, I'm not much of a maverick in, in, in the way I actually live my life. I mean, I'm um, not, I don't live dangerously, and I wouldn't want to. Um, uh, and I really like being part of institutions when they're, they're reasonably healthy, you know, when things are going well. Uh, I think if, if, a, if a society is in deep trouble and is highly disturbed to the point where attending it makes one almost sick, then uh, I won't go. I won't attend anymore. So uh, I, I, I think... To me, that's a visceral decision. You know, I, I don't think about it much. I just simply won't go back there again. But um, I've been fortunate uh, in, in my psychoanalytical career that I have been invited to be part of psychoanalytical groups at the Institute of Neuropsychiatry at the University of Rome for 20 years, practically. Uh, the Swedish Society in Stockholm uh, and, and other psychological societies that where I've gone regularly, several times a year for, throughout my career, where I can present my ideas, get a good critique, a, a, a non-ideologically driven mm -hmm. critique, uh, and where I feel I can present ideas mm -hmm. and I know it will be to a good container. <coughs> so uh, I've been pretty good at finding, in my view, mm -hmm. institutions that are in good in good nick, mm -hmm. where uh, you can you can present. Ideas and and uh, and get a good. 
Surely that's one of the challenges of a healthy personality is to be able to find your institutions and then co-create them rather than living as so many people do in this state of being persecuted from within the institution. I agree. I, I, I completely agree with that. And I, I, and I think that if, if someone is inside an institution and will be there for a very long time, mm -hmm. because they, perhaps they have no choice, mm -hmm. then they have to find some way to adapt to it. Um, now, this is a, an ex, this is a hyperbolic metaphor, but the same happens whenever anyone is inside a, an oppressive culture. In any side, if you're inside an oppressive culture, you have to find a way to survive. Um, and I think that um, quite a few individuals live and work inside highly oppressive institutions. Uh, and you know, those of, those of you who are psychotherapists and psychoanalysts uh, know that many of the people that you work with are, are living inside corporations or uh, institutions where they're profoundly unhappy because they're living inside an oppressive mm -hmm. atmosphere. I, I was fortunate, and I really do mean it, that, that, that I had a few people who said, why don't you come and teach here at the University of Rome? Mm -hmm. um, Adriano Giannotti, who was an Italian psychoanalyst, invited me to do that. And he was a good leader. Uh, and Arne Enstedt in Sweden invited me to come to Stockholm. Um, also, the Institute of Psychoanalysis in Chicago, uh, George Pollock and others invited me to come there. So, uh, those have been my three main homes uh, in, in, in psychoanalysis, and I'm, I'm grateful. Let's go back to 1973. You're, yeah. you're, you're here as a candidate, and you're doing the two trainings simultaneously at the Institute and at the Tavistock Clinic. And you, you told me you had eight supervisions per week. Yes, for about a year. How on earth did you survive eight clinical supervisions a week? With great difficulty. I mean, I, I, um, if I had an hour after um, a patient that I saw, I would write it up. Mm -hmm. But usually it was late at night or early in the morning, the next morning. And I was, I mean, grateful. I mean, one of, one of the good things about training in literature is that you have to recall the order of a text. Mm -hmm. You really do. Um, order is sequential order in any uh, literary reading is, is crucial. So I think it's one of the reasons I'm so interested in free association because there, Freud's theory of the logic of sequence is, yeah, the chain of ideas. You have to be able to recollect it. So that did me a good stead insofar as recalling uh, the beginning of a session because when it came to writing it up, uh, I just had to remember how it began. If I could remember how it began, the rest would just arrive. But, you know, one was exhausted. And Still, you've certainly got a lot of different views. <laughs> wait, wait, was it enlightening or was it maddening? Because you must have had many competing views on very basic technical questions. I think they were always quite interesting. I mean, the people I was... Um, the, who, who, who were the standout supervisors for you? Uh, Robert Gosling at the Tavistock. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a very good. David Mallon, he was independent. Uh, Sandy Bourne was very good. Uh, um, most of these people were analyzed by Bion, uh, interestingly enough. Um, and Paula Hyman was good. She was tough, but she was great. Marion Milner was very good. She was not tough, but she was very, uh, she was very good she, in her own way. She was different. Uh, so I, I benefited from working with some very good, good people. And was, what, what do you think was a more important dimension in shaping you as a clinician, the personal analysis or the supervision and seminars? Well, it's a mix, really. I mean, I, I've had three psychoanalysts. They were all very different. Um, and yet there's something about the process that's the same. Uh, and so I, I think I've benefited both from what they did that was right and from what they did that was wrong, mm. because you also learn a lot from an analyst's mistakes. Um, supervisions, I think, were very important in terms of discovering how other analysts thought and taking from them. I always exercised a negative capability. I mean, Paula Hyman would say to me, now, this is what you must say. And so I'd say, right, this is what I must say. And I'd go back and I would say what I thought I should say. Every so often I would, I would do a Paula Hyman session 
just for the sake of doing it. And my patient would think I'd gone completely off my wrong. Um, but um, but you, on, you only learn, really, if you do try to implement some of this stuff. Um, but no, I, I found it interesting. Um, and uh, I knew I'd been working by then, by 73, for, let's see, I started in 67 for some time. And I had several previous trainings. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had a pretty good sense of my own identity as a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. And then so as a psychoanalyst, I, I was, of course, influenced by people. But I, I felt like I knew what I was doing. Probably wrong, but I, that's what I felt. Did, did, did Paula Hyman instill her sense of naturalness? She writes about the importance of the analyst being, being natural. And I, I sometimes feel in your writings that there are resonances of that, rather than being a sort of textbook technician, as it were. Well, she is wonderfully open-minded, mischievous woman, uh, great sense of humor. Uh, we had one hilarious uh, moment because uh, after, I guess it was about a year, she said, so how long has it been that you've been a communist? And I said, uh, a communist? And she said, yes. How long have you been a communist? And I said, well, I'm not a communist. She said, well, you read the Daily Worker, don't you? And I said, what? And she said, that. It was the International Herald Tribune. So she, she had thought, she thought that all those years, that year, that she was, that she was trying, I mean, I can see that she probably had some difficulty, but anyway, she thought it was hilarious when she found out that I wasn't a communist. Of course, I mean, it wasn't altogether true. I mean, I'd done an awful lot of reading in Trotsky and Marx and Lenin and so on, but I wasn't a communist. Mm -hmm. so. um, and also, uh, I can say this now, I thought she was a very, very good analyst because the person who preceded me would come out of those sessions in floods of tears. I mean, she was usually in tears. Mm. And um, I saw her at the Institute right. and then discovered that actually she was the supervisee that had preceded me. <laughs> so she liked men. I'm not so sure she was so keen on the women. Mm. And we got, we, we got along very well, I mean, and, the first uh, supervision I had with her, I remember reporting the session, and here's, she would just go, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and I would say, should I stop now? No, no, please. <laughs> and then there would be, oh, no, no. And then she'd laugh. She'd roar, roar, and just laugh. But that's who she was. And um, uh, my advisor, Peter Hildebrand, who was a good bloke, that, are you sure you want to go to Paul Hyman? You know, she's very tough. I, said, I want them tough. And she was tough. Mm. But I, I like that kind of frankness. And, uh, so and you clearly have the capacity to take it. Yeah, to yeah take I like it. it. It's refreshing. Mm. You missed Winnicott, of course, by two years. Yeah. He died in January of 1971. Was that a great sadness for you, given how important Winnicott has been as a key theoretical influence for you? And also, you've been. Uh, a long-standing member of the Winnicott Publications Committee, yeah. helping to bring his unpublished writings into print. Uh, you've been very important in the Winnicott yeah. world. Well, I didn't really apply to the British Society mm. until um, uh, 72. I, well, that's not right. I, I applied, I wrote a letter in 71, or was it 70? I can't remember, to Enid Bollant and mm. um, uh, she wrote back saying that they only accepted senior non-medical, outstanding senior non-medical Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so that was a letter. So when I was cleaning out my desk a year and a half later, I came, back, I came across the letter and I wrote, wrote to her. And I said, um, as to senior, are, are you, you surely don't mean aged. Uh, as to whether someone's outstanding, that's not for, I would have thought, any applicant to state. That's for you to decide. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I went, so I wrote her a letter, I wrote her back, and she wrote me back a very nice letter saying, well, all right, fine, and then she, we went through this process. Um, I, you know something, I don't miss the fact that I didn't know Winnicott. Um, I'm not, I'm not, um, can I put this? 
I'm, I've always been rather shy of being around charismatic, famous people. Mm. I'm not too keen on the stars. Uh, and um, I went to the University of Virginia for two years, and Faulkner was teaching there, and he died before I got there. And I thought, well, you know, not a bad thing. Read the chap's literature. You didn't actually have to know him. Yes. So maybe that's slightly to do with the difference between relating and the use of the objects. Yes, exactly. I, I think knowing when it got, might have gotten in the way of my making use of it. Although from, from all I've heard from researching him, if he had met you, he would have endeavored to make you feel the star, actually. Uh, your, your chum, Michael Eigen, certainly says that about his first contact, and uh, his only contact with Winnicott. Well, then I really he would have run as a young him. as yeah. a young American student, yeah. and he said Winnicott made him feel like a great professor, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. He, he had a capacity to really foreground somebody else and find out about their wow. particular interests. That really would have made it difficult for me. <laughs> what is, I mean, obviously, we, we know from, from reading your writings, obviously, from the shadow of the object and from all your writing on, on character structure and character function, use of an object, who are the internal objects inside, you know, many of your many theoretical and technical contributions, how much Winnicott suffuses your thinking. Mm -hmm. But what is it you don't like about, about Winnicott? Are there, are there concepts or papers that make you that make you quake, because one doesn't have to fall in love with the entire mm. of, a, mm. of a theoretician's body of writings. I don't think that, that well, a couple of things, really. I, I, I don't think he understood the hysteric. I don't think he knew what an mm. hysteric was. And mm. so I think that uh, it, it's risky if you think that you can take an hysteric into a regression to dependence. I think that's a risk. And I think one does really have to know what an hysteric is. And so I think he understood the schizoid personality inside out. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I also think it's very, very interesting that he did not believe in free association. Mm -hmm. And here you have a chap who doodles and has squiggles um, and, and doesn't believe in free association. He thinks that free association, which reveals the threat of thought, is an anxiety. Uh, re it reflects an anxiety, and the free association is an omnipotent defense against this. Mm -hmm. That is astonishing for a man who believes in spontaneity. Mm -hmm. So he, do he doesn't really believe in free talking in the analytical situation. And of course, he reveres the notion of the this sort of formless state that the patient gets to, uh, where the analyst had is in a type of regression. Well, from a Bionian perspective, one might say it's a it's a reverie between the two. I think this is incredibly valuable, very, very important. But why that self-state and that analytical state should be used as an opposition to the freedom of speech, to free talking, it's beyond me. I don't know why one has to pick these wars with other parts of the analytical puzzle. Uh, it's great, it's a great shame. Um, and it is also interesting, I think, about the squiggle game that where the, the child begins with the free object, with the abstract object, mm. he completes yes. it. Isn't that interesting? So where true self begins, false yes. self ends. Yes. So I think that he had to make a false self conclusion to the true self gesture. And that's where I would be critical of him as well. I think there was something in his false self that interfered with his own true self capabilities. So I see him as a man who was probably in a lot of conflict with himself, mm. uh, and uh, but his writings are profound, and I, I'd actually come across him at least when it, when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, I managed a bookstore in San Francisco, and uh, we took the TLS, and Guntrip's book was um, was reviewed, and I ordered it for the store, of course, uh, and and read Guntrip, and then um, ordered the Winnicott. Huh. And so that was 1965. Gosh. Uh, and, um, and and I, by the time I started working with the autistic children, mm -hmm. I had read everything that you could read by Winnicott and by Francis Tustin and um, a lot of Klein, a lot of Grunt, all the gun trip mm -hmm. that was available then. Mm -hmm. so this was all eye-opening stuff. What's lovely is how generous you can be with your own self and your own intellectual development, not stinting yourself, but really, really having the whole banquet.
mm. and, and really enjoying all these influences. Mm. And of course, you, you met Eric Erickson and I think worked with Eric Erickson as well. Yes, yes Erickson was, um, uh, in fact, when I was accepted at the British Society uh, in 1972, I, I asked him, I, I, I said, what, what do you think? Because I've been accepted as well as at one of the American institutions. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I said to him, well, I think I'm going to go to the British Society. What do you think? And he said, well, young man, it's a long life and you take your chances. <laughs> <laughs> I was so pissed off. I was so angry. Oh. I, thought, I went, I went so soon after that to, to the telephone box and called up my friend Murray Schwartz. And I said, you know what Erickson said? And um, I thought this was really ducking things. But actually, in the years to since, I, I, looking back on it, it was an incredibly wise thing to say. And it, it you know, it, it, he was right. Um, what he, did he have in mind, do you think, particularly? That, well, he didn't like um, British object relations theory. Mm. So he did not like the British society. But he wasn't about ready to say to me, don't do this. Because he could see that's what I wanted to do. Mm. So he didn't step in my way, in a sense. And he didn't want to discourage me. So he had to come up with a statement that was like a transitional phenomenon that would allow me to go forward that without sanction. Mm. You know? And he was absolutely right. It, it is, comparatively speaking, a long life. And by God, you do take your chances. Mm. And, uh, but he was, what I liked about him is that he was very, first of all, he was very, he was a gorgeous man, absolutely beautiful. White, white hair, and beautiful eyes, and uh, whimsical, uh, not arrogant, listening to cases, and then he, when he would say something, it was you could never predict what Erickson was going to say. <coughs> and it wouldn't be a, 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 a long, boring speech. It would be less than a minute. Uh, and that would be it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and he was very caring towards the, his students and the people that he worked with. He also bore up uh, under the strain of the fact that he was not popular within the American ego psychology movement because he was regarded uh, be, as a popularizer. Because his books were successful, he suffered the fate of the colleagues who thought, well, he's not serious, he's not a real analyst. This is the sort of thing he had to put up with. He wrote too well, one could say. He wrote too well, that's right. And uh, so he paid a price for that. Um, I also had, as a teacher, Arnold Mundell in Boston, oh. and Modell was a mm. terrific teacher. I had a seminar with him for a year, and um, very open-minded man, very, um, so, rather like Andre Green in the sense that, insofar as open-mindedness, that he's read a lot, read widely a lot, and has a respect, Modell has a respect for the different schools of thought and makes use of them. And so I was fortunate to have him. Mm. Wonderful teachers. Um, I'm in a real quandary because time is just going by so fast. And I, I have about 80 more questions that are, that are burning, uh, quite apart from, from more subsidiary questions. But I, want, I, want to, I think I want to come to your, your more uh, allegorical writing, to use Audrey's expression. Because you have, in the last two years, published two novellas. A third is on its way, which I want you to tell us about. And, and a wonderful collection of plays called Fairer Play and Other Plays. And I'd love to know how, after you, you, know, you, you really have created such a wonderful library of formal psychological books with you know, chapter structures and clinical vignettes and so forth, how you came to move into the more fictional arena, and, and whether you would even think of them as fiction, actually. Because it, it does feel like a change of style. I think it is, yeah. I, it, it really was, uh, I had no choice. I, I uh, as you know, when you're invited to give a paper, it can be a year and a half or two years or more ahead of time. So uh, then when I come up with a topic, and so I've been invited to give a paper in Milan um, on some that and they wanted a topic, so I said object and other. I didn't know, you know what the hell was I going to write. I didn't, that was, it was years away. But uh, then as my, my custom would be to write in my notebooks something. You still keep the notebooks. I still, keep, still keep the notebooks. Yeah. Gosh. And um, <coughs> that something would then start to gel. And then when it's a, a paper for a, a, a psychoanalytical society or a 
something that around about a year before I do it, uh, I'll, I'll just, while walking around you know, the neighborhood or whatever, say, so what about Milan? I mean, what are you going to say? What's, what's happening? I don't know. Um, but of course, the, they need to be translated, these, these mm. um, essays. So six, usually six months before I give uh, a, a talk, I write it up. And six months before, I didn't even know what I thought, much less write up. Because three months before, they want the paper for translation. Three months before the talk, I didn't. I still didn't know what I was going to say, and I thought, "Why did you come up with this idiotic topic, object and other? I mean, you don't know what you're going to say." And I was really up against it, and I just came down into my my study one day, and I said, "Well, look, if you don't know what to say, why don't you write about somebody who's stuck with this topic and see what he says?" Uh, so I invented a psychoanalyst who worked with a patient, and I, it just took off. It, you know, it wrote itself, so to mm. speak. I was enormously relieved, but I was very worried about what the, the, the Milanese would be thinking about this as a, um, as a scientific, scientific presentation, because it, it, it was fiction. And so I wrote them, and I said, look, I've got good news and bad news. I finished this, and it can, I can send it straight to you. The bad news is, I'm afraid it's fiction. It's not. It's not a prose essay. And they said, "Fine." I was completely stunned. They said, "Sure, send it to us." I did. I read it to them, uh, uh, and they had it to the Italian translations. They quite liked it, much to my surprise. It led to a good discussion. Um, and it sort of went from there, and then I just found that much easier. I, I had uh, come to a point where I realized what was going on. I'd come to a point where, quite frankly, I was really tired mm -hmm. of my own literary voice. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't bear my literary voice anymore. Mm -hmm. I really just didn't want to write like that. So, and I, if you tire of yourself, uh, and you're you like writing. If you tire of yourself as a writer, you're you're in trouble. So, but I found a new form, which I enjoy, and um, so I hope this lasts for however long. It it broke the kind of the sort of authoritarian dimension of the essay that one is somehow meant to know something. And even though I tried to keep my essays open, that there was a, still a voice within me arguing something that I was really beginning to dislike because it was too authoritarian. There wasn't <laughs> enough doubt. I couldn't create enough conflict in my essays. Uh, I, for me, I was falsifying mm. things. And I, hate, I began to really dislike that. The plays are different. I, I wrote plays when I was at Berkeley. Uh, yeah. But they were all, they all went up in a fire. They were literally. literally. Yeah. But on my, my stuff I stored in a storage locker, uh, and some arsonists came along and, and torched the whole building. And I'd written about 12 one acts, and they all went up with it. Um, but life was so intense in those days, I had to get on with, I mean, I was being prosecuted by the U.S. District Attorney's well, I had to get on with really important stuff, so I went on. And I never, never really thought about it again, a, a few times. But almost 40 years to the day, I went down into my into my study and I wrote a play. Gosh. Yeah. Gosh. That was just a just a, a purely unconscious uh, action. I mean, I must say that they're, they're beautiful pieces of of fiction and and very hard to put down. So I, I really recommend them for those people who've not yet seen the novellas and the plays. One question I did have is why mental health professionals feature so prominently in Dark at the End of the Tunnel, in I've Heard the Mermaid Singing, mm -hmm. and in all of the ferret plays. They're not all about psychoanalysts. There is a cognitive mm -hmm. therapist who makes an yeah. appearance, mm -hmm. and there are frequent uh, appearances and voices of uh, biological psychiatrists. But I thought, my, my first thought was, you know, given your Melville background, given your yeah. literary background, you know, you could be writing a play about a, you know, a Corsican milkmaid or yeah. anything. And I thought, 
why, why does the psychoanalyst appear even through your fiction? I thought, did you not want to break from yourself and all your colleagues? Uh, well, that might be happening. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm writing a, that's very hard to describe it, but it, it, it's a book of poems, but it's really called Conversations. And these are always between two somewhat abstracted, anonymous people, uh, and they, they'll talk about um, odd kinds of things. And there's no psychoanalysis in the book at all. Mm -hmm. And in some of the plays, like Apply Within, and um, one or two of the others, there, there isn't anything that this doesn't have to do with psychoanalysis. So, however, the novellas probably will continue because mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're meant to, do, well, originally meant to be directed at a particular theme. Now, the one that comes out in a month called Mayhem is really about memory and fantasy and how confused people can get. Um, and so, but I also like the psychoanalyst as a character. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I think right at the very beginning, when I made the decision not to be an academic, but to become a psychoanalyst, mm -hmm. um, I, I decided that the, the reason I wanted to do that was um, that it was the best position that anyone could be in to study mankind. Mm -hmm. you, could, you could read Shakespeare, but if you want to study mankind, you can't be in a better place mm -hmm. than as a psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. And I was very interested in who we are and why we are the way.